Welcome back to the Church Renewal Podcast. I'm your host, Alan Edwards. The Church Renewal Podcast is a ministry of Flourish coaching. Flourish exists to set ministry leaders free with the gospel to be effective wherever God has called them. On this episode of the Church Renewal Podcast, we're looking at the gospel for the pastor in our Renewal 101 series. Renewal 101 is all about the building blocks of church renewal for people who want to lead their congregations in renewal and revitalization. In our last episode, we looked at the church life cycle with our executive director, Matt Bowling. Today, Matt joins us again to talk about the importance of applying the gospel to the life of ministers so that they can be healthy and effective in leading their churches. Join us as we dig into the ways that Jesus is renewing his church. All right, Matt, welcome back to the podcast. Uh, Today, we're talking about the importance of applying the gospel to ministry leaders if we want to successfully and and by God's grace lead renewal revitalization in our local churches. You know, I've heard you say, Matt, um, that it takes healthy pastors to lead healthy churches. Uh, What do you mean by that? Um, Great to be back, by the way. Um, I think, um, so what do we mean by healthy pastors? You need healthy pastors to lead healthy churches. So you can't give away what you don't have and whatever you have, you're giving away. Uh, That's a one way of putting it. Pete's because there's a different way of putting it. But I think that um, the idea is that if you want a church that is being changed under the gospel, then you need to have a pastor who's being changed under the gospel, that, that he needs the pastor, the ministry leaders, the elders, the deacons, the those who lead in ministry. They all need to be experiencing change under the gospel, just like we see in the New Testament letters, right? That's the way that Paul, um, uh, uh, the way that he pushes congregations is to understand the gospel more clearly, more deeply, and apply it to their lives more broadly, that we need um, ministry leaders who are doing that themselves. They're experiencing the benefits of the gospel themselves today so that they're they're being changed. And so that what they bring to the church um, holds together. It's got integrity. Uh, they're saying, uh, ministry leaders would be saying then, um, come and believe and live in light of this gospel that I am, that I'm experiencing life in the midst of. Come and experience life as well. And let's do it together as a congregation. And so when you have healthy leaders like that, then you have a chance of having a healthy congregation. Now, I I know that a lot of folks who are trying to affect church renewal and revitalization provide a, a plan for a congregation to get healthy, you know, um, and I don't want to diminish the importance of having a plan. You know, we're going to talk later in this series about strategic planning. Sure. Um, but do you think that there's been an, enough sure. emphasis on the spiritual health of the leadership in terms of renewing and revitalizing churches? I don't think so. I because I I think that um, we're one of our board members. Um, I was in his home uh, a while ago, maybe a year and a half ago. And I was describing to him uh, another friend who has done revitalization, uh, Harry Reader. We've reviewed his books. Uh, I've greatly benefited from his teaching. And he actually has the same emphasis on the gospel uh, for ministry leaders being the, the, uh, the A to Z, um, and which I very much appreciated. And I was lamenting with this board member that we have, Chris Vogel, who's actually been interviewed on the podcast before. Um, I've lamented with him that, that the work that Harry Reader did was commonly taken as a program when he was trying to teach a process. And Chris kind of looked at me with a twinkle in his eye and he kind of said, do we know how to take anything different than as a program? And I think that we have become so used to just adopt a program, 40 days of purpose was a very common program, right? Um, each one reach one, right? So we're, we're um, and, and not bad things. I, I, don't, I don't want to diminish the, the heart behind them or even the wisdom and the insight there. Um, it just doesn't go to the core, uh, in my mind, uh, of why we would do a program and really what would motivate us behind a program. It's not that a particular program could be bad. It's just that it's not a solution. It's much more of a, a band-aid than going to the middle of real what really needs to be different um, about a church. And so we want to kind of go to the middle of what needs to be different um, and then work out from there. And and you would suggest that really what needs to be different about most churches and most pastors is greater 
grasp, apprehension of the gospel? What What do you mean when you say the gospel for or or taking hold of the gospel? Isn't the gospel just like the entry point for you know um, uh, uh, when you become a Christian? Right. Um, I think if that's a common way that the gospel is is um, is a I understood and sort of um, grasped by people, by ministry leaders, the way that it's taught. But I think that that's actually a pretty grave mistake. Um, it's not the way that that the Apostle Paul, for example, um, conceived of the gospel. Um, when Paul would look at a, a person, a leader um, like Timothy, and the way that he needed to grow, the way that he talked to Timothy about his own growth revolved around the gospel. When um, Paul confronts Peter in Galatians 2, what does he say is the issue with uh, Peter's conduct as it relates to Jews and Gentiles? He says, it's, you're not living in step with the gospel. When he ministers to churches, what does he tell them? He says, yeah, you're doing Yodi and Sintiki, one of my uh, guys that I'm coaching. Um, uh, pastors I'm coaching is preaching on that this week in his church. You know, why don't y'all get along? But where does he start earlier on in, in Philippians to deal with that? He starts with trying to teach them that it's it's the gospel that empowers that kind of living. So, it, he, so here's the bottom line, I think, for ministry leaders is that you're going to not only can you not give away what you don't have, you're going to give away what you have inevitably. And so if you if what you have is a program orientation or a process orientation, um, then that's what you're going to give away. That's what you're going to put hopes in. That's what you're going to try and lead in light of. Whereas if the, the center of this is the gospel, then what you're going to give away is gospel transformation to people. That's that's um, that's the way that you're going to think about. Uh, why we would do a program and how we would do a program and what preaching should look like. And as we go about small group ministry or youth ministry or whatever, all of those would be centered um, around going more deeply with the gospel and applying it more broadly. So, um, so to that end, um, what do you think it is about being in ministry leadership that, that a lot of folks in ministry leadership are are often giving the gospel. They are extending the grace of Christ that enables yeah, and yeah. spirit spirit filled obedience to Christ to others, but they're not getting filled up with that themselves. Why why do you think that 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 disjunction is happening in a lot of churches? I think it's because we don't we haven't really plumbed the depths of what does it mean for how does the gospel, how can the gospel be understood and applied to the push and pull of being a ministry leader? Um, what is it, for example, very common sort of um, scenario. I was just uh, texting with a leader this morning. You know, how do you apply the gospel to the insecurity um, that I feel uh, that I don't quite know how um, I'm a um, Anglo-American, uh, you know, I don't quite know how to talk to people about um, the race issue in America. Now, how do I minister to my own insecurity about that? Do I kind of just try to get strong? Do I, do I um, just kind of grit my teeth? Do I kind of drum up courage or grit? Do I, um, do I just read up so I feel really well informed? Or is there some resource there in the gospel where I can turn to Christ? I can ask the Holy Spirit to help me understand these gospel truths that can strengthen me in my inner being. That's what Paul talks about, that the gospel does, that it strengthens me in my inner being. What does that look like? How do we go about that? That's that's our passion as we would think about this task topic of the gospel for the ministry leader. So if I've got, if, if, I, if I'm listening today and I'm a ministry leader and I'm thinking, yeah, I, I would like to hear those sweet truths of the gospel that, that fill me up and minister to my soul. You know, in your experience, Matt, you work with, with dozens of pastors and ministry leaders every year. What are some common themes of the gospel that you think ministry leaders need to hear again and again so that they are that they are they are so glad at the gospel that they are set free 
to to lead change and lead through conflict and and lead congregations toward greater spiritual health and vitality? Yeah, it's a great question. I, I think that the, the biggest center that I think that other shoots grow from is really um, my sense of self. So it is my sense of identity primarily rooted around the fact that I am in Christ. That's the way that Paul puts it, right? And so um, sometimes that emphasis is that I'm going to be adopted, um, that that I'm God's and that he's got me. I think that uh, another way to look at that, if we were to look at sort of a, from, from a multifaceted direction, um, is where is my sense of self? Is my sense of self, um, a, am I working for that? Uh, so we talk about identity in Christ. Um, and here's what we mean by that. that I, some years ago, um, as I was struggling with this myself, it, in the vicissitudes of, of pastoring week in and week out in a church, I came to realize that there was a big difference between working for an identity or receiving an identity. There's a big difference between working for an identity or receiving an identity. If I'm working for an identity, I have to just spin continually. I've got to do the right things. I've got to say the right things. I've got to be smart. I've got to not uh, upset people. I've got to keep um, things moving. You know, and it's really all about me and what I do. And that my sense of self is based on, um, you know, what I get done or or how things go. And that's just incredibly nerve wracking. And on the other hand, what's offered to me. Uh, in the gospel is Jesus says, how about if we put all of that down? How about if we stop working? Um, And that's why I use that word, because we all sort of know that um, in terms of our standing before God, works don't have a place there, right? Neither to get in good standing with God or to stay in good standing with God. Our our works don't have a place there. That, That place with God in his family is secured by Christ. Um, should we seek sanctification? Sure. But we seek it in light of the fact that God has included us in his family and we're thankful for that. And, um, and so um, it, the difference is, do I have a sense of self that is based on what Jesus has already done for me and that my spot is secure in the family of God? And so that is what sits at the center of who I am and the way that I think about myself. Or is it um, that my sense of self snaps up and down based on how things are going. And if it's based on how things are going, that means that my sense of self is incredibly unstable. Um, some of our listeners might have, and maybe we can link to this in the show notes, Alan, but the, some of our listeners might have heard of um, Tim Keller's uh, little um, sermon that was made into a, a booklet uh, that's called the freedom of self forgetfulness, and I, I'm telling you that what is um, what is in there. I have not met somebody who has read that presentation of what I'm talking about right now and gone. I need to read that at least once a year, every year, because of how clearly um, it's made clear that what's available to us in Christ is a stable sense of self. And it's what we all need, it's what we crave, it's what we, what we have to have to do ministry well. And it's given to us. It can just simply be received with an open hand. So Matt, I don't think you would say that, hey, pastor, if you all of a sudden get a real stable sense of self, you, you receive your identity from Christ, you are, you know, other language might be you are resting in Christ or you're resting in your union with Christ. We wouldn't say that, okay, once you're doing that, Pastor, your church is going to blow up overnight and be uh, this big, healthy, successful church. I mean, church renewal isn't about necessarily um, massive megachurch growth. But how does how does a pastor with a with a with a grasp of the gospel for himself, how does that begin to change a local congregation? So here's a, a couple different things here, and our time's probably running short, but I think that uh, here's maybe two or three different ways that that really helps. The first thing that it does 
is that if I don't have to be somebody for other people, see, that's the way most of us get our identity, is that we stay in good standing with other people by the way that we act. We're performative. Um, so if I don't need that anymore, if I don't need that other people are happy with me, um, then what that means is it frees me um, to stop doing some things and to start doing other things. So I, I can stop. Um, spending my life trying to keep other people happy around me. And instead, I feel free to simply do that which would please the Lord and let the chips fall where they do. Because I don't need, you know, X person who's going to be upset if I move towards killing this program. Um, I don't need them. And I don't, it's not that I don't need them. It's not that I stop loving them. It's that I don't need their approval anymore to feel okay about myself. See, most pastors know what they ought to do to lead in their congregations. They just don't feel free to do it. Instead, they're captive. So it, it frees us from needing to continue to do some things um, that are actually wrong, that, that are not going to help the congregation move forward, right? And it frees us to move towards certain things. Um, this, uh, we had a situation in a church that I led where um, there was a very disruptive leader but I wasn't free to go address that disruptive leader. It did you mean disruptive in like a negative sense, yeah, like a uh, roadblock? Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. But I didn't feel free to go address them. And so I didn't. And it, it really, really hampered the ministry of the church. I wasn't free to move towards that person. Um, and so by having this identity that is grounded in Christ, it, that's actually what's needed in order to have the freedom and courage to move forward in leadership. Without it, it is, it's maybe seem too harsh, but it's all performative. Um, it, it's all performing to keep people's approval or to not upset people. Um, and you just can't, you can't really lead when that's your posture. Right, right. So Matt, if I, if I am hungry, if I'm a ministry leader, if I'm particularly a pastor and I'm hungry to, to imbibe of the gospel more deeply for myself so that I, so that by God's grace, I have this sense of freedom to lead. I'm, I'm more free to love people and less beholden to them in a negative way, more gospel grace, duty bound to love them in a, in a healthy way. If, if that's what I'm hungry for, um, are there some some practical things that I as a pastor can do. Maybe, maybe some resources to like read. We we mentioned uh, the the freedom of self forgetfulness by Tim Keller, but uh, other than so maybe some resources. But are there other things I can begin to do practices that I can that I can that I can engage with that will will help me experience the gospel for myself as a pastor as a ministry leader. Yeah, so I think a couple of things. Um, uh, one book that we've actually reviewed that I reviewed uh, is a resource review on the blog that you can look at is a book called Gospel Fluency. Um, and there's also a handbook that goes with it that you can go through with a group. Um, and that will really kind of break open this whole area of me thinking about um, if the gospel is a language for life, a language for living, a language to dialogue with my own heart and with, and with other people. Um, then becoming fluent in that language is the idea of Jeff Vanderstelt's book, Gospel Fluency. And I can't more highly recommend that. It's a, a longer, popular uh, version way of talking about what Keller says pretty densely, say, in the freedom of self-forgetfulness. And so that would be a really, really, really critical resource. I think the other is the way that you pray. Um, I find that a lot of pastors pray um, what I would say in a very sort of transactional way, and I don't mean that pejoratively, but descriptively. So they pray for their preaching. They pray for individual people in their church. They pray for need, that budget would be met and that leaders would be raised up and people would be discipled. All super appropriate things to pray for. But they don't pray for themselves. Um, not in the sense of, um, you know, turning over in bed in the morning and praying for their own heart to be grounded in Christ, to be free to go forward in ministry on that day, to really own and be able to say, I am loved by God. The most important things in life have already been settled for me because of Christ. So Lord, free me um, to live, not for people's um, pleasure, um, 
but because I love you and I want to serve you and I want to see your kingdom come. I heard Tim Keller talk one time um, about a practice that he keeps, which is that yeah, he's a you know at this point um, up there in age and tends to wear dress shirts with pockets to work and things like that, and that may not fit you know all of our audience, but but the practice that Tim talks about I think is a really important one. Someone asked him one time, you know, how do you pursue your own sanctification? And he says, oh, I have this three by five card that I keep in my pocket, and the person who was interviewing was kind of like, what? And he goes. Oh, does everybody have a three by five card in their pocket? And the interviewer is like, no. And he goes, oh, so I have this three by five card in my pocket. And on it, um, I have a, kind of a catalog of sort of the big setting sins right now that I'm dealing with and how the gospel applies to them. And, and so I look at it in the morning and I look at it in noontime and I look at it at night. I look at it in the morning and pray that the Lord would keep me from those besetting sins and free me by the gospel. And I do an inventory at noon about how I've done so far and, and you know, how I need to embrace Christ and, and turn from my sins and my idols and, and be free in him that afternoon. And then I look back at night and, and I look back and I see, you know, how, how did the Holy Spirit answer my prayers for that day? And how can I pray for the next day? And it was just one of those very simple, but really profound and helpful practices. How different would our lives be if we just did that really simple thing like that? Um, and I think that that's a, that's a really um, helpful, practical thing that, that people could do with their phone. They could do it with a three by five card. They could do it whatever way they want. But just that reflectiveness um, pushing the gospel into my heart consciously, purposefully, day by day, multiple times a day, as it applies to the particular things that I'm struggling with. It's just a great habit. Yeah, that is. I, I just want to turn that question around to our audience and just ask you to reflect for a minute. How would your day be different if, if throughout the day you were reflecting on the ways that, that sin and the brokenness of this world is impacting you and your life and at the same time, reflecting on the ways the good news of Jesus and the love of God and the grace of God is speaking into each of those. Matt, thank you so much for, for walking through this, this concept, this building block of church renewal. Some people wouldn't think of this kind of, um, maybe they might call it a touchy-feely topic as a, a building block for the process of church renewal. But, but if the premise is right, that it takes spiritually, emotionally healthy leaders to lead healthy churches, and it's absolutely a foundational concept. That's why we include Gospel for the Pastor in our Renewal 101, the building blocks of, of church renewal. Matt, thanks so much for, for expositing and for, for, for meditating on this topic this morning. Oh, my pleasure. Glad to do it. Great. Well, hey, thank you all for listening to the Church Renewal podcast this week. It's been a joy to just think about the ways that the grace of God speaks to the life of ministry leaders. If you're a ministry leader who who is, is wrestling over these ideas, we would love to spend some time with you. You can always reach out to us at flourishcoaching.org slash contact or connect with me directly. I'm Alan, A-L-L-A-N at flourishcoaching.org. Uh, if you are getting something out of this podcast, if it's helpful to you and your ministry, please consider subscribing. Give us a, a rating or a review on Apple Podcasts. Uh, share it with a friend. We would really like to advance this message of church renewal. Uh, and, and the reason is that that Flourish is here because we we care about uh, ministry leaders, no matter where they are in the life cycle of the church, when they feel stuck or uh, when they feel hopeless, our coaches come alongside them to to apply the gospel to their lives and help them gain some clarity about their situation. Uh, and the reason we do it is that uh, that Jesus is yet gathering a people to himself. It's the only fully sufficient reason that this day dawned. Um, and so the ordinary way he does that is through the ministry of the church. And, and, and that's why we are, are continuing to explore these building blocks of church renewal here on the podcast. Thanks for listening. Uh, tune in next time as we continue to explore the ways that Jesus is renewing his church.